Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Lazy Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Sam Priestley, and as always, I'm joined by my lovely wife, Emma. Say hello. Hello. Today we're going to be telling the story of how I kind of got started in working for myself. Um, It's a story that Emma takes almost zero interest in, so she won't have heard (laughs) most of this before. I remember I once tried to recruit you at one point in this, and you just laughed in my face. I never brought it up again. You probably don't even remember that. <laughs> I vaguely remember it, yes. Um, you're one of the only people I've met who weren't at all interested in this. But therefore, it'll be new to you, and hopefully, um, if I fluff over stuff too quickly, you'll you'll uh, bring back and ask some questions. Well, what I do remember from that initial conversation was uh, I wasn't interested, but I did say a few of my friends were. Mm, yeah, that that makes sense. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about professional gambling, which is actually the first thing I did that really made any money. I started in my second year of university in uh, 2008, and then I did it kind of full-time-ish up until about 2014. I did do some other businesses during the time. Uh, generally, especially once I got serious about it, I was doing it with um with friends we start formed a partnership and we always had this idea that we wanted to build other other businesses as well you know invest the money we were making and so sometimes i would go off and focus on something else so for instance most of 2012 was taken up with our um our price comparison website et advisor but generally you know throughout most of that time there was at least two out of three of us working full time on this so what do I mean by professional gambling? Well, I'm talking about anything where we had kind of mathematical advantages over the bookmakers or casinos and were were making money. Um, it all started with cashback sites. So there's websites such as Top Cashback, Quidco, Cashback Kings, places like that where they basically work similar to affiliate sites on blogs where um, businesses will give them a bit of money if they refer customers uh, and these cashback sites would then pass on most of that um, that commission to to the user uh, that might not make much sense so let me give an example so for instance let's say something like coral which is a bookmaker was on there they would say to top cashback any customer you refer to us will give you £50 and then Top Cashback would say, we put on their website, anyone who signs up for our link will give you £45. So often what you could do, you could sign up somewhere like Coral, um, their requirement would be you have to deposit £50 and you'd get a £50 cashback from the cashback site, which meant that um, effectively that money you put in there was free you know you could bet it a few times and then if you won withdraw it yeah so it's effectively it's coral's way of marketing and trying to get new customers exactly that's exactly it they also go a step further they often give you a bonus as well when you sign up you've probably seen them around uh, sign to coral and get a 50 pound free bet things like that um which then took us on to the next step which is very well known now it's called match betting and it's basically where you take these free bets that different bookmakers give you and you um, you fulfil their requirements which is often to bet it maybe once or twice you do that by kind of hedging your bet at a different bookmaker or a betting exchange and that um, that step from going from getting this free money to, to start gambling and then match betting is that quite a normal step for kind of an online gambler to do? Um, well, so what they're hoping is that well what they hope is that you'll end up and then start using that for your recreational betting. Yeah. So they know they're going to lose money from your first few bets, and then eventually. But it is now very well known. These cashback sites don't really exist much anymore, mm. but the kind of the match betting side of it does. Right. And that's very very well known. Like it's at the time we kind of had to work out what to do ourselves. Whereas now there's hundreds of guides, there's, even, there's a guide on my blog, um, there's loads of services you can sign up to and pay a monthly mm-hmm. fee and they'll give you all the offers every every day to, mm. as they come out. And, and you say uh, at the time, that was about 10 years ago you started? Yeah, 2008. Yeah. In 2008 we were doing this. Um, by hedging out, well, I mean, if you think about a table, uh, like a, 
going to say a table tennis match. True for table tennis match. <laughs> a tennis match, there can only be one winner. Yeah. And so if you bet on both sides at the correct odds, you can, you know, even out or potentially make a bit of money mm-hmm. just from that if you find the correct odds at different places. After that, we then moved on to casinos, which was a bit more complicated, but they had the same kind of offers of a free bet, but you can't really hedge out on them. So instead, you're taking a bit of a risk, but it's kind of a mathematical risk. So you started, for instance, you put £100 in, they give you a £100 bonus. So now you've got £200, which you say you need to bet once in order to make any money. So you could, for instance, put that £200 on red on roulette. If it loses, you've lost £100. If it wins, you've made £300. So it's almost 50-50 chance, slightly less than that. But in general, if you do that 100 times, you're going to make loads of money. Like, if anyone ever offers you lose 100 or make 300 on a coin flip, you know, you should probably take that. That's a good a good bet. But it's not risk-free, whereas the match betting stuff we started with was. So mm. it's kind of a slow progression as we got more confident with the math, we got yeah. more confident with, you know, investing money on these kind of things. It got better and better. And at the end of my end of that year of university, the year before in the summer holidays, I'd worked as a caretaker, and I'd done two hundred fifty pounds a week. And I thought if I can do this kind of full time through the holidays and make two hundred fifty pounds a week, then I'll do that instead. And I did, and I managed it, and um, and it was kind of all uphill from there. And then in my my third year of um, of university, we started to take it to a slightly bigger level I started getting into what's called arbitrage which is situations where two bookies disagree on who the favourite is in a certain event so back to the tennis match example if their odds are different enough you can bet on both places and regardless of the outcome you can make a bit of money Mm -hmm. so I was a computer science student so my dissertation for my um, my undergrad was um was on arbitrage and I basically developed software which would kind of scan lots of different bookmakers and find um, opportunities where there was and there were these places where you could go and bet on both things and and make a bit of money was that really complicated so I didn't do that well on my dissertation not because the stuff didn't work I didn't know that software is still in use by people today uh, in much more advanced forms but it's not very groundbreaking in terms of computer science. Yeah. I wasn't inventing any new algorithms. But it was quite commercial. Yeah, it's very commercial, which yeah. is not what they wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Out of my, um, <laughs> they wanted like a research project where I'm sort of pushing the boundaries of algorithm design or something, yeah. or efficient storage use or something like that. But it wasn't that. I mean, I got 68% or something on it, which is like a 2-1. A high 2-1. It was a high 2-1, yeah. But... Considering it was making me quite a bit of money at the time, I yeah. thought that was a bit cheeky. <laughs> I actually done like a youthful project. I think it's what university should be all about. <laughs> kind of that practical side, yeah. yeah. And to be fair, I, I went back and I did a master's afterwards. And um, for my master's, we did another practical thing. But this time we chose our supervisor a bit better. Yeah. And we found someone who really appreciated practical stuff. Yes, and would mark you accordingly. And I think on that one we got eighty percent or something ridiculous, yeah. and that was a like a, a GPS system that would um, for cars, which would basically take the data from all the different cars and map, you know, the best route based on traffic and all that kind of stuff. Stuff which is now quite common on um, sat navs, yeah. but at the time wasn't. Yeah, so that was that. We started doing started doing arbitrage. Um, develop these computer programs so nowadays you can pay and rent software like this it's quite common and you know i mentioned before the kind of match betting services where you pay like a monthly fee often those ones now have um uh they now have these odds finders as they're called built in so that you can you know find good matches for your match bets but at the time this was you know we were there were a few around but we were kind of targeting markets that nobody else was so we'd be the only people arbitraging them then you know we got we got more complicated you know a big part of what we we're doing was looking for places where bookies would would mess up slightly uh, so we were looking for stuff where there might be a rule difference between one bookie and another 
and where that rule difference would then leave like an opportunity. Uh, we were looking for mistakes that companies would make, you know, if they misprice their odds. Um, you know, for instance, we would, for like smaller bookies, we would often work out the formula they were using to create the odds. So when there's a new market, especially something a bit weird, like whatever, the um, the number of red cards in a football match where it's not a very well understood market, they'd often have quite a simple formula to create those odds. And then once we knew that, we could then reverse engineer it and find the opportunities where that formula was wrong and maybe we could make some money. Um, we Yeah, so a lot of it was looking for these weird opportunities. Another example was a new betting exchange opened and a betting exchange is where instead of betting against a bookie it's a marketplace so you can buy and sell bets with other people uh, we discovered that they were kind of propping up their own they were they were playing their own markets using quite simplistic um, like robo betters we found that we could manipulate those robo betters in order to like do stupid things where we could take advantage on it um, they worked that out pretty quickly and sent us a polite email asking us to stop (laughs) (laughs) Um, and it kind of just went from there we did um, did a lot of data mining where we would look at how the change in odds would would sort of ripple out so stuff like if a team scores in a football match how does that affect the number of the, the odds of like the number of red cards happening in that match and so we'd so once you get kind of a few levels down to that, you'll find that people are very quick to change the odds on um, saying who's going to win the game, but they might not have mapped that sort of um, interaction far enough back. And so those odds, the odds of the red cards happening would change quite slowly. So we did that for a while. Um, eventually we got, we started running into, into problems with the bookies were working out that we were smart betters yeah. and kind of limiting our accounts. Nowadays, they're very quick to do that if you're doing arbitrage. As soon as they work out that you're not a regular punter, they will close your account down, um, which is actually illegal in some places. That's illegal in Australia, but it's not illegal here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and they, they have the right here to say, we don't want you as a customer anymore. So what we started doing, we started leasing out our software and our knowledge to other people in exchange for like a proportion of the profits they were making. And I think that's what I tried to recruit you to do. I'm not going to go into too much detail with how that works because I've still got friends who who do that. Um, But you kind of get the idea. We'd have sort of tens to hundreds of people who would be using our software, who we would be, you know, communicating with on basically a daily basis on you know what to insert situations and basically focusing on our software side of it so how would it work would you send out like an email to these people saying these are the opportunities for today no it was all software that they would have running on their computers and then it would um it would give them kind of opportunities and then they'd always be on whatsapp or phone call to us type thing okay again i don't want to go into too much detail about it because people are still doing it and i don't really want to tread on any of my friends toes who are who were doing it? Um, it was it was kind of like a much more intense version of what a lot of these. So now there's a lot of software you can sign up to where you pay like whatever ten pound, fifteen pound, twenty pound a month, and you'll get along with ten thousand other people uh, daily offers or yeah. all these opportunities. So we would have that, but it was much more intense, and only with a hundred people as opposed mm-hmm. to ten. But they would be giving us a lot more money than 20 quid a month yeah um, thinking about maybe we should have gone the other route because those companies are now doing really well and they're a bit more in the open whereas we us recruiting was quite a big challenge because we had to find people who are interested and then kind of convince them that um, that it worked and we weren't, were we weren't charlatans yeah. yeah yeah exactly um, we did we, we did well out of that things got harder um that still kind of worked. We tried a, a different a different method at one point. We um, we wanted to place the bets manually going into bookies uh, because there you don't need accounts. They don't know who you are. But if they recognise you too much, they'll get to know it. So we sort of built up a network of people who we would, um, you know, give them money. They would go to different bookmakers 
place the bets based on an app we developed for their phone. And then um, they would then take a photo of the betting slip and it would go into a computer program and work out you know, the odds of it winning and all this kind of stuff. And then it would alert them if the bet won and they would go back and pick up the money. And at the end of the day, give it to our agent who was like, so we have agents coordinating these groups of people going around. And then eventually they get recognised, so they have to dress up in disguises. And... That's my favourite bet. Yeah. <laughs> people in wigs yes. running around. <laughs> That kind of worked, you know, there's a lot of leakage when you have so much cash lying around, just people making mistakes and maybe people stealing from you, I don't know. Um, so it didn't work quite as well as all online. And also people started getting recognised quite quickly because they were placing kind of like a £500 bet on a quite obscure marketplace that no one else would bet on. Yeah, it looked so, quite odd. But the, the pattern was quite easy for people to track. Um, and then by this time you know we got to about 2014 things were still going well our software was a real cutting edge uh, and then I quit I retired really basically I really I'd got a bit fed up with the business I'd made quite good money out of it and um, and I wanted to do something where I was actually like contributing towards the world with this betting you know, it was intellectually stimulating because it was always like competing with the bookies and trying to find like opportunities and all this kind of stuff. But really, you know, the money we were making was just coming out of the profits the bookies were making. We weren't actually improving the work. We weren't creating a product. We weren't doing anything like that. And it's always a bit adverse, adversatorial, whatever the word is, you know. You're always trying to deal with people who don't want to deal with you. Yeah. So it's all a bit sneaky Hard undercover. Hard work, yeah. yeah. You know, all this was 100% legal, um, you know, we weren't doing anything wrong, but if we were out in the open, we would very quickly have been, you know, we were making money as long as the bookies didn't know what we were doing, effectively. Yeah. As soon as they got clever enough to close one opportunity, we would have to, like, find another one. As I say, it doesn't still work, and as I said, I've still got friends who are doing that nowadays, and still doing really well, but I just got a bit fed up with it, and moved on. I've been saying that there is a bunch of stuff that I do go back to every now and again. Um, I'm really interested in automatic algorithmic trading on betting exchanges, which is where you basically like create some like AI style bot that just goes around placing bets for you on um, on these betting exchanges you and are makes such money. A geek. I am a bit of a geek, <laughs> and maybe like once every couple of months I'll go back and do some work on that. And I think I will spend a lot more time on that, kind of again because I just find it really interesting, and I'm, I kind of have this idea, like this idea that eventually it'll be a, um, just like a money machine. You turn it on, it just goes off and prints you money. That'd be nice, <laughs> wouldn't it? It would be nice. Uh, and I think it's very possible. And if anyone could do it, I should be able to do it because you know, at some point we were like probably top five in the world at professional gambling. And, you know, things have moved on a bit, but not that much, you know, still. Stuff like, you know, we collected more data than I think even the bookies have. And I still have all that data, so I could, like, at some point go and delve into that and find opportunities. Wow. Um, but each time I start doing it, I realise I'm not a good enough programmer, really, <laughs> to, to work it all out. And I've got other things I'm more interested in. Yeah. But I do go back to it every now and again. And you made a conscious decision to stop doing this. Yes, yes. And if I did do it, it'd be more of a hobby than a... A business you know I'm much more interested in the other stuff we're doing at the moment yeah and I think one of the key things um the successes of the of this type of business was that you you did make quite a lot of money that meant that you can invest it into other businesses yeah yeah and you know it's part of this whole you know podcast the blog and the idea of doing stuff for the lifestyle you know doing work so that it it um creates a lifestyle you want rather than living a life that enables your work. So once I kind of made, you know, I'd made a, a decent amount and my table tennis business was kind of taking off, which was a bit more hands-off. And I thought, you know, I could retire and travel the world or laser my arse and watch TV 24-7 for the next 10 years or so and we'd be fine. Play computer games. Play computer games. Yeah, I'd got quite interested in like early retirement and you know having been financially independent, sort of having enough invested that you didn't really need to work. And yeah, I'm not, and this business really helped you to do that. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, other things have happened since. Um, with some of the investments I made, it haven't worked out so well. But still, you know, it's it. I've got a lot to be thankful for for that. And at effectively, a very young age, I was able to um, make a decision just to focus on stuff I want to, rather than than jobs that made the most money. Um, so where are we going to leave this? You know, this isn't an advert for you to start gambling. In fact, you probably, um, if you have any sort of addictive personality or you have any history of, you know, losing money, betting, then this is really not for you. I think one of the reasons we all did quite well is that none of us had really ever gambled before and the gambling part never really interested us. Mm -hmm. It was all like the maths behind it, making the money, the opportunities. Um... If that does sound like you, maybe have a look into match betting. It's now very easy to get into. The It'll be very difficult for you ever to get to the level we were at because um, everything's a lot more out in the open now, which means there's a lot more people doing it, but also means the, the, the amount you can make is a bit more capped. Yeah. The bookies know these opportunities that exist and they're happy with them, but they, wanna, they limit them. So, you know, you can make a few thousand pounds, maybe two or three thousand pounds fairly easily. Um, have a look at my blog post on match betting. You can just Google Sam Priestley match betting to find it. Um, or um, if you want to look into arbitrage, I've got some on that as well. Um, or you know you can post a comment if you've got any questions. Yeah, I hope that wasn't too boring for you, Emma. <laughs> it was quite interesting. Yeah, was, was is there anything there that you found that you didn't know or you had more questions about? No, I think I did know most of that. Hmm. Yeah, I think you need to give me more credit. Yeah, yeah, you probably pick up a bit more when you hear me talking to other people yeah, about exactly, it. Yeah, exactly, because it is something, particularly when we're travelling, something that a lot of the other travellers are quite interested in. Yeah, when we were travelling the world and staying in hostels and stuff, we did meet a, a few people who were doing it, who were match betting kind of full time. Well, not full time, as in to fund their travels. Yeah, and they, they weren't, weren't necessarily doing it very well. No, they were. They weren't. They weren't at a at a big level, but they were making a thousand pounds a month. Which, if you're staying in hostels and living in South America, is more than enough. Yeah. Um, which I think is what a lot of people use it for. Yeah, don't approach this sort of stuff as a business. Like, it is very difficult to become to make any like real big amounts of money out of it and there's very only very there's only room for a very f- small number of people doing that and they're all doing very innovative stuff they're not following like the match betting recipe and just getting up they're you know finding opportunities that n- no one else knows exists um but you can make a, a bit of money if you yeah, want yeah it's good for kind of top topping up your income or... yeah if you want to go traveling or you want to buy a new kitchen or something <laughs> or if you're like me and just want to invest some more money <laughs> It's good. Or if you're lazy and you don't want to get a job after university, you might use this as a way to delay that a little bit while working on your other businesses. Which is kind of how it all started. Kind of all started, yeah. It gave me not so much the money because we often didn't really invest much money into things, into businesses we were starting. It was more the time, and you know, and also the way to think. Well, I, well, yeah, when I say invest into businesses, I mean it pays your lifestyle costs mm. while you set up these new businesses. Yeah, I it's don't not, need it's to. It's not that you have hundreds of thousands of pounds to invest in this brand new business idea. It's that you've got a bit of money to pay your rent and your food that month while you have lots of time to think about setting up these new businesses. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right, let's leave it at that then. Uh, thanks for listening. As always, you can email me at hello at sampreci.com. Please subscribe, and uh, if you leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast um, service you're using, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye.